My name is Rick Fletcher. Uh, I am the uh, technical services manager for Turf and Owner Metals with New Farm. Uh, been in the industry over 35 years uh, and have had the privilege of being able to muck around with stuff, doing squirt and squints, and uh, asking the questions that you would give me and saying, okay, does that work on this? And going and doing the work to find out, and then taking that information to labels and educational sessions, et cetera. So, uh, I hope to impart some of my knowledge on you, and then you can ask questions and see if I'm, I'm really an idiot. But So today, a little quick agenda, just uh, talk about New Farm for a bit as far as what we are and what we do. Uh, I want to really focus down into you on the role of scouting. Um, we did a little bit uh, earlier on the disease management part, and of course, scouting and disease management is a little different than scouting with bugs. And I say that because Scouting with disease management tends to be more preemptive. Scouting with bug management tends to be more proactive. <clears throat> you guys tend to wait and see until you see a bug, and then you go and figure out what it is and go squirt it. Where disease guys, you have to be on top of it ahead of time. So it's a little bit different, and I'll go through that with you. And then today's program, I want to focus on the flyers. So since we're doing fall, <clears throat> we'll talk about fungus gnats, shore fly, and white fly. And of course, white fly, we can divide off into a whole bunch of different categories there with the four common white flies that are here uh, in the US. And we could argue about if there's more and then look at the uh, whether we talk about the B or the Qs as well. Uh, finally, want to talk about applying it right and just making sure I touch on application techniques and the importance of making sure these things work. And then if there's any time for questions and answers, we'll do that. So New Farm, uh, over 100 years old, uh, came from Australia, has done a lot of development work over time with a variety of different products and, and uh, materials. But mostly, I would say, our lineage as far as building our portfolio has been uh, from the New Farm line, from the Cleary line, because New Farm purchased Cleary, and that was where I came over, and then from the Valence Sumitomo line, which has also been merged into that. So. You look at our portfolio today, and we're very broad as far as insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, growth regulators, et cetera. And since we're talking about bugs, you've probably seen some of these, these uh, materials already as far as what we offer and what you may have used. So today we'll touch a little bit on natural. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about distance, et cetera. But there's a few materials that you're probably very familiar with. Anybody remember this guy? So the Lone Ranger, right? So the Lone Ranger was known for two things, right? He rode off on his horse yelling, Hi-O Silver. And what else did he do at, at the scene? He always left a silver bullet, right? Let him know he was there? OK, so which one of you want a silver bullet to leave here and go solve your problems? Right? She's already heard the joke. Right? We're all looking for the silver bullet. I, I, I kid people. I didn't do this in the first one. I kid people that the Lone Ranger did what? He carried two Colt Peacemakers, so there's 12 bullets. And then he had a whole belt full. There's another 40 bullets. So what's the idea here? Remember, all of these weapons, these, these parts, are all pieces in your management program. There's no one that does everything. But together, they're integrated. They do something. And that would be my argument. So we've been very active as far as bringing materials to market in the last few years. Since 2015, we've brought on a variety of herbicide, fungicide, insecticide uh, materials into the marketplace. And some of the newer ones, the Engulf, the Sperato, uh, the Cheetah Pro, which is the glyphosate alternative material, which, of course, glyphosate's another hot button we could have a talk on. But we brought a lot of materials into the market recently. You all bored? You know how long it took me to put that dog in that chair? OK. So talk a little bit about scouting. So one of the things I like to tell everybody is that the crops that you bring in, you don't bring in by ha happenstance, right? You've already got a plan. You've maybe made a commitment in a contract to grow X, to grow Y. So you know what you're bringing in. You know, when you're gonna, you know where you're going to put it on your farm or in your range. You've already got that all figured out. But my point is, as you're coming close to that, have you taken the time to look at that property and, and ask yourself several questions? What were my problems in this part of the range last year? Outside of the range, what's it look like? Do I have weeds? 
And the reason I ask those questions is that, remember, a lot of things that happen in a greenhouse, I'm going to call historic. In other words, if you had them last year, you're probably going to have them this year, unless you change some condition. So if you've got weeds outside, why are weeds important outside? Because a bunch of these insects, thrips and mites and stuff, like to live in the weeds that are outside. And if you open a vent and the guy flies in or crawls in, now you've got him. So it's little things like that just to think about, what did I run into last year? And can I fix that just by simply eradicating that problem, cleaning it up? Uh, look at the previous problems. Also look at some of the chemical methods that you've used, because we do have that R word. We do have the word resistance, right? So when you talk about some things, if we talk about white fly, especially with B and Q, who remembers myself and a few other talks, uh, speakers here last year at this same event telling you you're getting ready to have a really bad Q white fly year? You remember that last July? You know why we knew that? Because we already saw them in Spain. The Duman and the Ogilvy folks were already reporting to us that they were having really bad problems at their production ranges. And that was in July. Well, what are you guys bringing in July? Cuttings. What were the cuttings full of? Q white fly. <laughs> so, so we see a lot of these things. So look at the chemicals that you're, that you're using. Make sure you're doing what you can as far as understanding modes of action and doing resistance management. Scouting. Anybody flying a drone yet? So in Europe, they're flying drones. They're flying drones in 23-foot houses. They're flying drones. And the reason they're flying drones, more so for disease and nutrition, not so much for bugs, but they're literally flying drones over the tops of the crop, and they're looking downward to see if they can see patterns, if they can see that circular disease pattern, if they can see a chlorosis, that's something like that. And of course, my famous one, how many of you have gone into your range and seen that magic Z pattern? Anybody ever see a magic Z pattern? And then you go back and you look at your waterer, who is the worst paced guy, worst paid guy on your in your range, and you're watching him water, and how is he watering? In a Z pattern. <laughs> because all he can do is reach in this far. So they're actually using drones and some of this technology. So we all know about the tools. So the tools that you guys are going to fight with as far as a notebook, you're going to fight with or, or have with you some way to record what you're seeing. You're going to have a hand lens. We're going to talk about bugs. So you're going to have sticky cards. Now the fun part is, which sticky card do you have with you? Yellow or blue? If you have to make a mistake, get yellow. Remember, blues are specific mostly to thrips. So if you're fighting thrips, you want blue. But if everything else, you just want yellow. Close enough. Uh, you want flag tape. You want to be able to mark off your area that you just went and inspected so that you can go back to the same area and make sure that you, you're watching it, you're recording it. You want to make sure you've got maps of the greenhouses indicating your hot spots. These are all very typical things that you would do as far as your scouting routine. So the other thing, and you've heard uh, the two disease talks before. Nancy touched on it in the beginning. When you get your shipment of cuttings or plugs, you still have the right of refusal, don't you? You still have the ability to say, whoa, I don't like this, and closing the box and calling your supplier. So that happens with bugs, too. More than likely, you're going to open a box, and you're not going to find white fly. You might find the resting stages of white fly, but I doubt you're going to find, find flyers. But you might find shore flies. Because shore flies are pretty active, and they like to sit in that water. So we're going to talk about those a little bit. But when things come in, that's your first inspection. Make sure you're checking those cuttings, those plants coming in, and they're, they're clean. They're up to your standard. You don't want to be bringing in a problem. So we talked about this, the yellow card versus the blue card. We've talked about the location. You guys probably all know where they need to be as far as right above the top of the canopy. Again, remember that yellow cards aren't always great because the bugs don't all fly the same ability, right? Some guys are good flyers. Some guys are bad flyers. Some guys are hoppers. So if you've got a bug that you know that is a bad flyer, what does that tell you to do? Put out more cards closer together, <laughs> right? That's what it tells you. So there's little tricks like that just to make sure. 
So we talk about the card. Um, indicator plant. Any of you keep any of you keep your uh, oh my gosh plant in the corner as your indicator? Good. I know people that like to do that because if this plant gets it first, then I know I've got it. Well, if you already know that that plant's got it, then it's everywhere. What are you doing? <laughs> Get rid of that plant. So we look at stuff like that, and, and this is a very quick down and dirty list of, of what insects tend to be on what plants. So this is available in a number of locations, uh, but it's just a quick guide that you say, okay, I'm worried about, um, I'm worried about a white fly. What crops can I be my indicators? What am I going to find it on first? Well, we're growing poinsettia right now, right? You're going to see it there. Uh, you might see it on, on uh, some other things that are out. But a quick indicator as far as what bug might show up on what plant. Yes, that is a flip-flop uh, electrical device between two flip-flops. So if, if you want to have fun with your crews about safety, this is on the DarwinAwards.com website. And it truly is. It, it's pictures of people trying to take themselves out of the gene pool. So I put this up because we, as a researcher, we do the squirt and squints, we ask the questions, and then we go to the regulatory people and the marketing people, and we write the labels. So, so far, I have not been able to write an idiot-proof label. I've written a lot of idiot-resistant labels, but I can't write an idiot-proof one. So you still have those, hey, Rick, can I do this? No. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> OK. So we're going to lead off now with uh, fungus gnats. And of course, the fun part about fungus gnats, we can talk about the difference between fungus gnats and shore flies. Um, anybody uh, growing cannabis as part of their side range? Not yet? OK. Just curious. I can't tell you how many calls I get from, I got the bug in my cannabis. I need to spray something. And, well, uh, unfortunately, there's nothing legally labeled for cannabis. You can do it, but I'm not telling you how to do it. <laughs> you guys all know that, right? That currently the EPA kind of gives a wink and a nod that if it's labeled for tobacco, that it, they'll probably let you do a wink and a nod. The state of Oregon has a list published of wink and nods that were labeled on tobacco. So they're kind of like not looking real hard under the mat. You know, the gift horse thing, you're not going to look in its mouth. OK. So we deal with fungus gnats. And the thing about fungus gnats is always think about fungus gnats as far as what they eat. The first thing they're going after is moisture and organic matter and leftover biology, bacteria and fungi that are there in that soil organic matter. After that, if they can't find enough of that, after that, they will start to attack the healthy plant. The healthy plant isn't always their first choice, but they will eat it, OK? So they're going after organic matter first and other things like that. So it's all about supply demand. It has a lot to do with what your media is, as far as what media you start with. If you have a heavy media, a cork or a, or a, or a, a bark or a, or a core type media, a little heavier, you can see shifts in fungus gnats populations based on the media you choose and how wet it is. So they sometimes will burrow into the stems. You'll see them go right into the stems, right at the rooting. Right now we're talking about poinsettias. So right as that, right as that root tip or that um, cutting tip is going into the, uh, into the cube, you're going to see fungus gnats right hanging around in there if they're, if they're attacking, if they're available. And then they'll chew into the roots. They'll go up into the stems. The important part about understanding fungus gnats as far as swimming around in water, using water as a, as a uh, traveling tool, and by eating what they eat and going into the stems of plants, they then become vectors of certain diseases. Things like the Pythium water molds, things like Phytophthoras, things like Rhizoctonias, things like bacteria. They can literally move from plant to plant because of their habits and their exposure, their environment. This is the fun part. What's the difference between a, a fungus gnat and a shore fly? Shore flies don't eat plants. They eat, they eat algae. Where does shore fly live? In algae. They eat algae. They don't eat your plants. They bother you. They're a nuisance. If you loaded a whole tray of them onto a trailer and shipped them to Home Depot, they wouldn't like seeing all these little flying things come out. But they're not eating the plant. So that's one of those fine delineations. So how do you tell these guys apart? So there's some very 
key straightforward things, of course, I've got listed up here, you know, about the body shape. So one of the easiest things, the body shapes are one's long and thin, one's short and fat. Is that easy enough? Straightforward, right? You get to the larvae. The larvae are very different. One larvae, it looks like a worm with a black head case. The other, warm, other one looks like a, like a kind of a snail. It looks like he's got two antennae on top of his head. So they're very different as far as how they look and how you can tell them apart. And of course, you've seen pictures like this, you know, of the, short, of the uh, fungus gnat larvae with their black heads, and of course, the fungus gnat stuck on the sticky card. And then you go over to the shore fly, and you can see a very different picture there on your left with what looks like the, the antenna of a snail. So it's a very different disposure, and the bug itself, short, round, winged, different structure altogether. So you put them side by side. You know, you can see these things very clearly. It, it, within two seconds, you can say, all right, I got X, I've got Y. And it's pretty straightforward. And of course, the adults, same thing. You get them stuck on a sticky card, very easy to pull apart, X and Y. And of course, you get some weird things like this. How many, how many times has your scout come and said, oh man, I'm getting a big hit over in range six. And he brings you the sticky card and it's nothing but parasitic wasps, which you just released two days ago. It happens, right? It happens. You have to figure out what I've released and what it looks like and make sure that you've got a proper identification. If you look at the life cycles, you'll see the life cycles are the same. They're dipterans. So they're going to have an adult. They're going to have an egg. They're going to have a, a crawling larvae. They're going to have a pupil stage. And there's going to be some subtleties in those stages as far as what they look like. Both of the stages happen at about the same amount of time. So there's no huge differential in one's faster, one's slower. It's just, where are they growing? Fungus gnats are going to be in, in organic matter in wet areas. Shore fly are going to be in algae. One's going to be under the bench, unless you've got really bad media with algae all over the top of it. One's going to be under the bench. One's going to be in your media. So they're going to be in very different locations. The other thing that can happen, and remember this, is that their life cycles are such that you can get overlaps where you've got all four stages going on at one time. Now, it won't happen right away because you've got to have the event, and then you've got to catch up and get it crazy, you know, and then it gets going. But later on in the, life, in, the, in the history of your house, you will eventually see all four stages going on at the same time, which means what? When you go to break a life cycle, you don't want to hit it in one spot. You want to hit the life cycle in at least two spots. So in the case of something like a fungus gnat, you want to go and try to hit the adults because the adults are lousy flyers. Any, any pyrethroid or whatever can knock the adults out of the sky. Do you do it with a, a Cornell head or do you do it with a fogger? You do it with a fogger, right? You want fine little particles that are going to hit these lousy flyers. If I've got big droplets coming out of a JD-9, unless I've got an anti-aircraft gun, I'm going to have a hard time shooting these guys down, right? And then you get over to shore flies, and of course, shore flies are 10x the speed and the agility of a fungus gnat as far as flying. They fly way better. So the nice thing about those guys, though, is that if you go into shore flies and you have a problem with them, they'll get agitated. And when they get agitated, they tend to run to the windows. So where do you aim your fogger? <laughs> aim it at the windows, because these guys like to go there. So it's little tricks that you can get as far as improving your control. All right, what else to tell you? I talked about the sticky cards. Anybody using potatoes? Right, old tried and true? It works, it works. If you think you've got, if you think you've got fungus gnats, a few potato cubes cut up, put it on the top of the soil, and you can go back in a few days and you can start getting ideas of, oh boy, I've got a lot, or eh, I've only got a few. Right. What's the importance of that? Remember, sampling can be destructive. These guys are living in the root zone. So are you going to take one of your new cuttings and yank it out of the ground and go, hmm, don't see any on that one? Right? You're not going to go destroying these things. So the potatoes tend to be quick little indicators that you don't have to go through a destructive process. What else to tell you? So I talked about this as far as moving the diseases. You can see here, this was a picture of a, of a root which was, was starting to show the symptomology of feeding. And you can see that it's weakened it. It's, eat, it's eaten off most of the root hairs. 
it's having a hard time getting started, and, and this plant is going gonna, is gonna to quit because it can't get started fast enough. And a lot of the plant symptoms is another picture where it's totally clubbed it off, and then it started to callus. So a lot of the symptomology is going to be moisture related. Why? Because it can't develop a root system because the fungus gnat's nibbling at it. So you end up seeing this drought stress, this phenomena, and then you get the holes poked into it. And when the holes are poked into it, now Pythium comes in, now Phytophthora comes in, now Arwinia comes in, and all these guys can go into the wounds where this guy is fed. What else to tell you? Okay, so integrated approach. Remember I talked about breaking the life cycle in more than two places. So best management practices, the easy ones, right? Do the best you can to keep your floors clean. Now, I know some of you have concrete, some of you have gravel, some of you have weed mat, some of you have soil. I get it. But do the best you can to keep your floors clean because these guys are living in organic matter, living in algae, and right now you've got a whole bunch of poinsettias in cubes on benches and you're misting them and they're wetter than who knows what. So the environment's perfect. So do the best you can. Under the benches with um, antifungal or anti-algae materials, you know, a Q salt, to strip it, you know, you name it. There's a whole host of materials just to keep it clean under there. Yes, it's going to be hard to control your water right now while you're trying to get these propagated. I get that. But do the best you can. Um, chemical controls. So when you start looking at chemical controls, you start getting into those life cycle breaks. So trying to control the adult, trying to control the larvae, trying to work in those two things. And some of the more common materials, products like ADEP, product like distance, products like natural, citation, pylon, azotin, all are some good materials. Where can you get this data for yourself? You're supposed to yell out the answer. Where can you get this data? Remember, I, remember, I, remember you wrote it down, IR4, exactly. So my last talk, I harped on this. This is a free depository of data for you guys. And if you're not linked into that, they're your tax dollars at work. If you've got a problem, they can research it for you. So please tap into them and use them. But this information is all in a big report, which you can get there for your looking. So I just summarized a few of these. As far as adult sprays, I talked about these guys letting to migrate, going to surfaces. Remember, don't use big droplets. It's a lot harder. You're going to go down to a ULV or a low volume spray in some of these areas because you're trying to target those adults that are flying. So small droplets are going to work better. What else to tell you? From our packet of uh, materials, things like distance as an IGR to stop that from stage one to two, to stop that, to stop the development stages. Things like natural, which is a, which is a standard as far as a BT. Uh, things like safari or anything else, a, a pyrethroid, et cetera. There's a whole host of materials that can work for this. Remember, there's also some biologicals available for you. So if you want to try this under low disease pressure or low insect pressure, pardon me, these things are available for you. Things like Botanigard are probably going to be uh, in that uh, uh, bailiwick. And then some of the nematode materials like Nemashield or Nemesis are some materials that you can put down that are in that early stage, that low pressure stage. If you get to big pressure, these things will not chase they won't keep up, so you'll end up losing ground as far as uh, over time. But again, it's all about the pressure and where you go. And then, of course, we have the hoppus, um, the hoppus mites that are out there as well as far as another biological that you can use. Good? Come on, somebody's got to be a Rocky and Bullwinkle fan. I'm watching some of the young folks going, Rocky and Bullwinkle, who's that? <laughs> hey, I cut my teeth on Rocky and Bullwinkle. Okay, moving over to white flies. This is where it gets fun. So I popped this slide up for you. So right now there's a little over 14,000 five or 50 white fly species in the world. That's a lot, right? How many come into Florida all the time? More than we know about, okay? Some of them don't live, some of them die, but the spiraling white fly, the banded white fly, the gumbalumba white fly all came in from the Caribbean into Florida and they've happily lived in Florida and luckily haven't gotten much outside of Florida. But the other guys that we're used to, the greenhouse white fly, the sweet potato white fly, the silverleaf white fly, 
have all been here for a long time. So we're very used to what they are and what they do. And then, of course, you've got the B and the Q question, right? How do you, how, if you look at a white fly, how can you tell if it's a B or a Q? It changes color, right? It puts a, little, it puts a cape on and says, I'm a Q. No. The only way you can tell is test it, right? Or do the tried and true method. I just squirted chemical A. Chemical A didn't work. That must be Q. Right? That's the expensive way to test. I would tell you there's a little cheaper way to test it. So of course, you know, you look at your white flies. Remember that your white flies, at least as a Rube Goldberg, they are pretty identifiable. So you look at some of the basic structures of these pictures, and you're going to see some very telltale things. You're going to see size differences. Some are bigger and some are smaller. And you're going to see differences in their wings. Some have rounder wings. Some have longer wings. Some have spaces between their wings. And if you just pick up on those very short little telltales, you can very quickly identify a white fly adult and go, hmm, that's X. Now, you can't do that with a juvenile, and you can't do it with a nymph, but with an adult, these very easy pictures, you can tell right away what you've got. Why is it important to tell which one you've got? What products to spray, because products vary on efficacy between species, and then the same thing. Remember, only one of these is a B or a Q. The other ones don't do B and Q. Remember, they're not all B and Qs. There are only some of them. So of course, here's sweet potato white fly, and you can see the space in its wings. And then we go over to silver leaf white fly, and you see the wings get elongated. And then you look the difference between the triurodes and the babesia, and you can immediately see the size difference. Immediately see one's bigger, one's smaller. So they're pretty easy to pick apart and to tell. You just have to know what you're looking at. Then of course, if you happen to see this guy, I found this guy in Louisiana already. I haven't found him in Texas yet and he's as far north as uh, South Carolina. This is, the, this is a, uh, a banded wing white fly. So he's easy to kill, but he's here. So again, the, the whole thing about understanding these, which one do you have? Their life cycles, luckily, are very similar as far as the span of time it takes for their life cycle. The stages that their life cycles go through are very equal, so you're not having a lot of difference there. But you think about what these guys like to do. And remember that the adults like to be up high in the plant, and the juveniles like to be down low in the plant, typically. So you tend to see this segregation of where these guys like to live and feed as far as their sugar supplies, their protection, et cetera. So you can start picking them out and just going through with a, a typical scouting routine. You can find them. How are we doing? Three minutes. OK. Uh, the rate of development is, is pretty much temperature dri driven. So you're going to see changes in your August and September white flies versus your November and December white fly. As far as the, the warmer it is, they're going to go faster. As it cools out, as you start to change the temperature in your houses, especially for poinsettia, or if you've got mums out the outside and the temperature's getting cooler, you're going to watch the white flies get longer and longer and longer in their life cycles because they're temperature stimulated. So typically, you're looking at about a 22-day life cycle. Uh, they lay a lot of eggs. The eggs can, uh, you know, can go through a merge all the way through uh, the new hatch in about a 50-day or a two-month cycle. So it is not uncommon for you to have every generation at your place, to have eggs, to have adults, to have larvae, to have pupa, all at the same time. And again, I mentioned to you this earlier about the fungus gnat. The important part about understanding that is that you're going to hit the life cycle in two places. Which two places can you hit for white fly? You can hit the adult, and you can hit the crawler. Can you do anything for the pupa? Unless you do that to it, no. Most pupa are, are immune to any chemical you squirt on it. They've got this little shell. Think of a scale. Think of a hard scale. You, you have to suffocate them. All right, so if I've got a poinsettia with, with a ton of pupa from white fly, am I really going to be spraying a dormant oil on them right about now? Not going to go close to that one. So you really can't do much with the pupa state. So you uh, look over as far as uh, degree days. We do know a degree day model is available, so if you want to calculate that. We do know they lay their eggs in clusters. 
right? So certain white flies lay different patterns. So if you happen to flip over a leaf, remember the eggs are on the bottom. If you happen to flip over a leaf, you can actually tell the white fly by the egg pattern. So if you get that crazy, if you can't find an adult but you see the egg, you can actually figure out what you've got by the egg pattern. And of course, eggs, eggs up close look kind of like this, but you're like, hmm, I just saw those little white dots. No, they look like that, you go up close. And then of course, the, the crawler stage, those early larvae get little like a, like a little soft scale with a little antenna and they start to crawl around. And of course, you get to the pupal stage, which they harden off, you can't do much with them. And then that uh, pupa, the adult emerges out of that pupa, and then it starts to get on the plant, you're going, oh no. Oh no, I'm uh, three weeks away from BRAC formation, oh no, <laughs> right? And you start getting into this, or you get into that. And of course, symptomology, if you're not out there looking and you get to this stage and you start to see the actual chlorosis, the feeding remedies or the feeding byproducts of this guy sucking the life out of the lower leaves, you start to see this symptomology. By now, you're going, oh crap, right? This, this crop is about two steps away from being pinched and tossed. <laughs> uh, what else to tell you? They tend to be direct feeders into leaves and into the phloem. And that's important to understand because they like to feed in the phloem. Why? Remember, you have insecticides that do two things, right? They stay on the outside of the plant as a protectant or they go inside of the plant. If they go inside of the plant, what's the predominant way that they move? They move in the xylem with water, which means they're counting on a certain solubility. You're counting on it going into the xylem. You're counting on evapotranspiration rate to pull it to the top of the plant. I just told you these guys eat in the phloem. So how many chemicals go up in the xylem and turn around and come down in the phloem? Not many. <laughs> Not in full strength. Not in full strength. We've got a lot of them that will do that, but not in full strength. So you have to worry about that. So again, I'm going to harp on the IR4. When the B and Q thing hit back in 2002, 3, and 4, it was an initial throw everything on the wall study, see what works. And what we got out of that was data like this. So again, this study is available. Oh, you want that slide? There you go. This data is available. This was just a quick synopsis out of the IR4 study. The IR4 study is here. It was last updated just last year in 2018. So you've got very current data that's available to you, which is just a synopsis. And it was literally every chemical that's available got tested against these things. So it's a very broad brush. What's stuck on the wall? Who's using exclusion nets? Anybody? So if you were in Israel or Spain, you went to any greenhouse, they're loaded with these nets. All right, so it's a real easy way, especially why? July and August, are you guys air conditioning your houses? No. You've got your cooling, run, your cooling pads running, you've got your windows open, right? And what's the farmer doing across the field from you? Cutting his alfalfa? And where are those white flies coming after they cut the alfalfa? If they're downwind, they're coming to your house. If they're upwind, they're not gonna have an easy time. But if they're downwind, they're going with the wind to your house. So exclusion, think of some simple things, especially July and August. When the farmers start, stop cutting hay, you can pretty much stop worrying about exclusion. But when they're cutting hay, you gotta worry about it. If you were in Florida and they're still growing tomatoes and cucumbers, you worry about it all year, because they're there. So sanitation, think about what weeds are outside, get rid of those, manually remove them, chemically remove them, think about screens, Think about what you can do, and then you get down to spraying. So we have all these fancy pieces of equipment, outdoors, indoors. Anybody spraying like this? So I took this picture, obviously I was in a greenhouse and that's how the guy was spraying. So what bug or insect or disease do you think he was going after? So I told, I told this in the first group. He was going after thrips. Okay, so how often do you find thrips on poinsettia? Like never? So if he wasn't going after thrips, let's say he was going after white fly, would a spray up into the air, which is going to come down and deposit itself on the top leaves, 
work very well for white blood. No. So what do you have to do here? You have to locate the chemical to where the bug is. You have to understand how the chemical moves. And of course, I'm going to say the nasty word. You got to you got to you got to space these things a little bit better. Right? Instead of 60,000 to an acre, you need maybe 40,000 to an acre. Give them a little room because if you're using a fogger or if you're going up and down the aisle with a sprayer, you need to get a little air circulation in between the plants because if not, the outside plants are going to get wet, the inside plants are going to be dry except on the top. Nature of the habit, right? So just think about stuff like that. Deposition aids, of course, we worry about chemicals on plants and of course you can get burned. That's why we use deposition aids because we want to make it sheen, right? We want to make it spread evenly, not accumulate in a spot. Are you scared? So very quickly, you guys know, that, you know, the neonic thing is still going on. I will tell you that EPA has postponed its decision again on the neonic groups. It put out the, pre, the preliminary on imidacloprid, and it hasn't done anything since. It was supposed to release dinotepheron, dimethoxin, and acetamiprid. It has stalled those. Those are now expected to come out in December. So they keep pushing this back. It's, it's kind of like kick the can down the road. Um, there has been a, an increased scrutiny looking at not just the neonics, but anything that has a group one or a group two label. What am I talking about? How many people have looked at the environmental hazards box on the label, right? And when you look at the environmental hazards box, it says on there, this product is toxic to bees, or this product might be mo moderately toxic to bees, depending upon condition. Well, at EPA, when we register something outdoors, we have to do three tests. Always have to do three tests. You have to do it on adults getting wet, you have to do it on adults eating it, and you have to do it on the hives. So it's called tier one tests. Every product registered outdoor has to go through those three tests for tier one for honeybees. We get those results back. Those results go to EPA. EPA does something very simple. It puts things in three boxes. Really bad, kind of bad, don't worry about it. So if you see an environmental hazard statement that says this product is toxic to bees, it's in box one. Are there more than neonics that are in box one? Are there fungicides that are in box one? So don't just blame neonics. So right now, if you had to look at what's left, and what did I do with, what did I tell you as far as what's left? If you had to pick products that are all in box three, which is the don't worry about it box, these are the products that you've got left. Who thinks they can run an adequate rotation year round to control your bugs with those 12 products? Okay, it's gonna get hard. So you gotta think about these. Anybody doing the MPS? So. If you are, I pop this up real fast because you, it's like uh, Weight Watchers. You know, you, you, you get your calorie points for in, whether you're a good, bad, or, or whatever grower, I don't know. But uh, this is a way of monitoring your inputs for sustainability, I get it. If you happen to be able to come by the booth, we've got all sorts of little things on poinsettias as far as programs. We've got things on mums for programs. Rick Fletcher, the tech guy, is not a big fan of programs because I do the program in my cubicle. I don't do the program in your greenhouse. So I don't know what your agronomics are. I don't know where you are in your cycle. So I advise you to take these programs and just look at them for cause and effect. I have this problem. What are some solutions to this problem? And that's what this I would advise you. Don't follow this from day one to day 21 because that's not, that's not going to fit your house. But it will fit cause or, or problem, solution, problem, solution. And that's what I hope you'll lose them for. So we've gone through a whole bunch of stuff, and I'm out of time, and I'll say thank you. <laughs>